Hello again. This week we are very lucky to have with us Professor Teresa Hernandez, who teaches Spanish in the Department of Modern and Classical Languages. And like me, um, she's also an anthropologist who teaches in a field other than anthropology, but she still uses anthropology and the concepts of anthropology in a variety of ways. And this gets back to the whole interdisciplinary nature of our course this semester and the ways we've been trying to find all sorts of different pathways into understanding Latin America. And one of the themes of the course, of, cor of course, is that there are so many different ways, different disciplines, and different pathways into the study of Latin America. In the second part of the semester, we have especially been focusing on the concept of culture and how culture and cultural studies offer us a different kind of path into studying Latin America, both past and present, by focusing on how people think, what they do, and how they think about their identity. Those are only a few of the questions that we can use the concept of culture for understanding. Um, Professor Hernandez has worked on a variety of projects. Her first book is called Delirio, The Fantastic, The Demonic, and The Real, The Buried History of Nuevo Leon. Um, and in that book, she really focused on folk culture and popular culture and stories and tales that people in that part of Mexico tell and how those tales do or don't relate to daily life and other issues. She has also worked on the history of a cemetery in Fort Bend, using that cemetery as a way to understand Texas history. And she's currently working on a project about undocumented college students and their experiences in Texas. But I'm going to let her tell you more about her work. Professor Hernandez. Thank you. Today, what um, there's two basic things I want to focus on. One is the state of Nuevo León, which I'll explain more in a moment. The other is the influence or the involvement of Jewish culture in New Spain. I'm not a historian. I'm an anthropologist that works interdisciplinarily, so I don't have a time frame when I'm Work, when I'm saying I worked on Nuevo León, someone will say, well, is it colonial period? Is it, is it, you know, the early 20th century? Is it the Porfiriato? And I say, all of them. It's <laughs> all of them. Uh, I would just, as I was doing my field work, I would just follow whatever kind of stories there were, and there were some that it sort of felt like maybe they were better to follow than others. So what I did was, this was supposed to be an ethnography, and after having studied literary criticism, cultural criticism, and the whole idea of going into people's lives and extracting information from them about themselves bothered me some. I wasn't very happy with going to someone in Monterrey, Nuevo León, and saying, okay, what do you think your identity is, or, or how do you see yourself, you know, straight out. Um, I wanted to do it another way. Nuevo León is, starts 30 miles, approximately 30 miles south of the Texas border, and it's kind of a, I guess probably shouldn't chance it, let's see. So it's kind of like this. That's an interesting story also. This area in the middle at one time actually extended to Texas, but the president of Mexico became angry at the people of Nuevo León and to punish them, well, because they hadn't paid taxes. And to punish them, he took away that strip of land so they wouldn't have direct contact with the United States. But it was still close enough. Nuevo León uh, was, uh, at, during the colonial period, let's say 1550, 1560, really on the edge. Well, it was even more, right? But it was really on the edge of, of, uh, of New Spain. There was hardly any European presence there. What I found, although the documents don't say the same, but from what I believe existed there was many indigenous tribes that were, that were nomads 
that uh, I guess you could say they were similar to Comanches and Apaches and probably maybe a continuation of those tribes. Um, they didn't have large pyramids like the ones in the south. They didn't have uh, ways that they had documented their culture. There wasn't a lot. There's some petroglyphs here and there, but basically very little that's documented, which, as you probably know by now, means that generally history doesn't take something serious if they don't have it down on paper or down someplace in a permanent way. So what happened, since there wasn't any documentation, over time, what many people say and many uh, text, history textbooks from that area say, there weren't indigenous people. There were very, very few, and that's why they all disappeared. And by the way, they all disappeared. It's not like the United States. It's more like Puerto Rico or some other place where they, they, the uh, uh, colonial people came in, and you know, by a certain time, there wasn't anybody recognizable that had that you could identify with any type of uh, indigenous culture. So people would say, well, there just weren't very many here. And then they would say, that's why the people in Nuevo León are so white. They would say, very light skin, because there's no mixture with the indigenous, because there weren't any. So that's what they would tell me. Although I found out later, I really believe it was, it was, a diff it was different. It, basically, it was genocide. And they were all gone, almost all gone by about 1880. And at that point, the Comanches and the Apaches came in because they were being pushed out of the United States. And they basically took the same role uh, in Nuevo León. And so there's a story in Nuevo León that's talked about a lot about the Indios Barbaros, the barbaric Indians, that they said there was this, this continuing war with the barbaric Indians until the end of the 19th century. And they said it was very barbaric that, that these Indigenous people would, they were cannibals, they would, they, would, uh, they would tear people to pieces, they were very, very violent, they said. So then probably about, like I said, 1880, it kind of was over. It, it extended somewhat till 1900. Basically, there wasn't any. There's a story somewhere around 1900 of one Indigenous man painting his face and walking into the hacienda of a rich family. And of course the children, the older children screamed when they saw him and said, oh my God, he's going to eat me. And uh, this is in a, in a memoir by uh, Sarah Belden that was written about Nuevo León. So that's, I'm going to try to see if I can go in a chronological way so it won't get too convoluted. So that's what happened up until about in terms of lots and lots of indigenous tribes up until about 1550. There was a little bit of movement, and by 1590, there were a handful of people in that area and also uh, covered the area of, so this isn't good, but this is uh, Coahuila. Ah. Coahuila. This is the bordering state, but it was sort of like seen all together at the time. Coahuila was part of the Nueva Vizcaya, which was sort of another area. Nuevo León, as of, say, 1590, was not an entity yet that the uh, Spanish crown identified. There were two men that came to the area right around eastern edge of Coahuila, nowadays 50 miles by car from Monterrey, which is the capital of, of Nuevo León. One of them was named Alberto del Canto. Another man was named Diego de Montemayor. These two guys, these two conquistadors, as some people would say, made a very strong impact in the overall history of Nuevo León and Coahuila, even though they were joined you know, by other people later on. Alberto del Canto was born in, in Portugal and came to the United States as a young man. Some people said that he was of Jewish descent, and most probably there's a good chance he was because at this time it was like a, if you mentioned somebody was Jewish, if you were in, in New Spain and you mentioned that someone was Jewish, then automatically the other person would say, oh, they they must be Portuguese, or if you mentioned they were Portuguese, they must be Jews. 
because they said that the population of Jews in Portugal was very, very large. So they were always suspect. Anytime anyone met someone from Portugal, they were more suspicious. The Inquisition was even more suspicious of them than usual. So Del Canto was Portuguese, even though uh, biographies written about him just say, no, you know, it's not true. He was never born here or, or he was never, you know, his family wasn't Jewish. They were not conversos. It's like this need to say that, that any type of Jewish background in, in, his, in his family didn't exist. Montemayor's background is more convoluted. Nobody really knows. His parents are mentioned in some of the census. He came over as a young man. So nobody knows exactly anything. At the tanto, they were able to at least write a biography. No one's been able to at Montemayor for lack of documents. So these two and one other gentleman uh, made three that were in that area, mostly in eastern Coahuila. And there are several narratives about this. And being that there's no documents right now that are archival, you can go and say, okay, it happened like this. All anyone can say is some people say it happened this way. Some say it happened another way. Some people say that they just came around, you know, earlier than 1590, and they settled and they started the town of Monclova or Saltillo, Saltillo in um, eastern Coahuila and did some other exploring in the area. Some other people say that they, the two of them with one other person, went as part of a plan from Spain to to settle northern what now is northern Mexico for the Jews to have a province or a, a, a place for themselves that would be safe from the Inquisition. Some people say that's a crazy story, but uh, the di director of the Museum of, Mon of the City of Monterrey told me in 1999 that it, he strongly believed that this was true. So around 1592 or so, uh, Luis Carvajal crossed over to, to Mexico. He landed in a place called Pachuca, which is north of Veracruz. Veracruz was the coastal city where almost everybody came. You know, you probably already know, it was the big place. Pachuca sort of to the side, and I always wondered about it, and I'll tell you in a little while what one of my colleagues told me later. It made so much sense. Carabajal was born in northern Portugal. He was raised in the island of Cape Verde by his uncle, who was a slave trader. The family was very wealthy. This family had gone to, to Portugal from Spain about the time of the, uh, the riots, the uh, anti-Jewish riots in Sevilla, which were about 1391, when many, many families went to, to Portugal. And then after a few decades, things settled down in Spain and they came back. So once they were back, they settled around Sevilla, and he married a woman named Guilmar Rivera. And through her dowry, through money from his father, and money apparently he might have gotten from his uncle, he proposed to the king of Spain to buy a patent, to basically buy himself land in Mexico. The, the patent was... Well, it was the sale was accepted by the mon by the king because at that time he was experiencing very very serious money problems. Um, even though Spain was getting lots of money from the mines in, in Mexico, he was spending it like the minute it came in. And so apparently, according to documents, and this again who, we're not quite sure, he gave the king of Spain two million ducats for the land. And the land was so big, it covers what now would be two-thirds of the nation of Mexico. And it overlapped the Nueva Vizcaya. It, it just was just so gigantic. It was amazing. And also, he was given right of inheritance. So if he were to have a son, his son would be the, the governor or the leader or the 
political director of this area that they named the Nuevo Reino de Leon, the New Kingdom of Leon. And this, this idea of the New Kingdom of Leon with the right of inheritance was again another story that's traveled through the centuries that um, recently I heard over and over and over again by people that would say, well, yes, Caravajal came and he was going to start a kingdom. That's why they said Reino. He was starting a kingdom and it was to hide the Jews. Uh, other people said that that wasn't true. So he, another thing he did at the time was he brought many, many, many family members and some other people and none of the people had to present limpieza de sangre certificates when they were going to cross, which at the time was the law. Um, they, they apparently it might have been part of the arrangement he made with the king. I'm not quite sure. It, it, I've read in many texts that it was easily bought, a, a certificate was easily bought, and, and it's kind of interesting too, because one of the things I, I, I like to do is analyze history, not just look for it, but kind of, I see it and I say, oh, I wonder what this is about. And I, one of the things I heard and read over and over was, you cannot, no, they, there weren't any Jews in Mexico because they couldn't cross without the certificate. And I heard that over and over and over for years. And then recently, as I started going into um, more original documents in Spain and Madrid, uh, with some archival work I did, apparently that's not true. Uh, they could be bought. And, of course, people went over easily. But it's so interesting that, uh, that so many narratives are so adamant that, that uh, people just couldn't go because there was this rule and they had to always follow the rule. And that's one of the things at least in New Spain that I found from that time to the present is that rules were very malleable. Um, not necessarily bad, but malleable. Yes? Um, did you say, are they called pureza de sangre certificates? Excuse me, I couldn't hear the, um, the certificates, what, what are they Limpieza called? Limpieza de uh -huh. sangre. Let me see if I can write it down. And were they... Um, what did they certify? No Jewish blood, going back generations and generations. Limpieza means to clean, of course, sangre means blood. These were so important that as late as 1820, people who are still required to have one in Spain or in Mexico for that matter, the first president of the Mexican Republic, Guadalupe Victoria, had a limpieza de sangre certificate. So that's something else that I, I believe is sort of, when you look at the history of Mexico and New Spain, it's something that's just there all the time. It's just sort of in the middle of everything else that happens, at least between anything that has to do with the, the colonial settlers. Um, yes, so these people that came with Caravajal didn't have the certificates. They came in through Pachuca, and some stayed in what is now Nuevo León. Some of the family went to Mexico City. There were several things that went on for about six or seven years after Caravajal settled in Monterrey, or near Monterrey. He, um, he had a number of indigenous slaves, which he was accused later of having mistreated them and some people say that's why he had he was arrested by the Inquisition he he was although he was a good Catholic in a sense that he practiced and in people I've spoken to lately that have looked at the archives they still say well he was a very Christian man and he there was just no trace of any type of Jewish culture ritual anything you know in him um, his family his very close family, nuclear family, were still practicing Jews, which included his mother, sister, and, and um, nephew, um, two nep well, one nephew for sure. And what happened, is, according to the stories, is that Caravajal's sister was practicing a Judaic rite, and he came across her. He saw her doing something, 
And, of course, he got very angry, supposedly, and screamed at her and might have even hit her. But then he didn't report her. And the rule was that you have to report anything you see. Those things repeat themselves. Uh, so you, if you saw someone practicing a Judaic rite and they were not supposed to be Jews, then this was a problem. So if you didn't go to the Inquisition and say, I saw this, then they have every right to come and get you. Yes. So, what? Um, just to get the story correctly, um, his extended family was Jewish. He himself had converted to Catholicism, correct? Yes. Okay, so they were the extended family was still practicing yes. the rituals according I, to the document. According, okay. Thank yeah, you. he his wife stayed in Spain, and uh, according to the documents, she was a practicing Jewish also. Um, but for whatever reason, they didn't stay together. He came back. He was an interesting person, a uh, very powerful man, able to go through lots of different groups, uh, obviously deal with kings and not be nervous about it. He had been part of a group of Spaniards, uh, Spanish sailors, that captured the pirate John Hawkins. And he became quite famous uh, doing that. It was in the 1580s. And that kind of famous aura that he had had something to do with uh, allowing him to go and see the king. The king was more likely to see him because this guy, he'd captured John Hawkins, was a big deal. So he's, he's in northern Mexico. It's pretty violent. Uh, the indigenous people are you know, really angry, and they're not like the, the tribes you know, around Mexico City. It's like Fautecas, where, where they just made arrangements with the colonial settlers and said, okay, we're going to try to do what we can. They, it was just constant tension and constant violence. And so they were, it, it was almost as if you imagine uh, an, a Western movie with a, with a covered wagon going across and how the, you know, this is very stereotypical, but how the, the wagon is there with the people and they camp for the night, but there's always this chance that the, the Native Americans are going to come, come shoot them or burn them. And it was this kind of mentality that they described that like at every time they turned around, someone could get killed or some livestock could be stolen, their, their homes could be burned. Um, and one of the reasons also that the king gave him this patent was because he was so powerful, they thought that maybe he could, he could pacify. And that was a word that come, that came up a lot in the text about that period, that he could pacify the Indians of, of that area of New Spain. So after about let's see, 19, four, four years, something happened. And to this day, I still don't know. Uh, a colleague of mine that has studied it very closely does not have, has, was not able to find the details. Caravajal, by the way, has been written about in many, many, many books. It's a very common story that's told in Mexico, even though Nuevo Leon is sort of out of the way, the way everything happened to him is something historians have often found really interesting. All of a sudden, Diego de Montemayor decided, for whatever reason, to, to collaborate with the Inquisition and take into custody Carabajal. Now, Montemayor was an interesting guy because he and Del Canto had done something strange a little a few years before. Montemayor was married, and Del Canto had an affair with Montemayor's wife. Montemayor became very angry, and he killed the woman. And then he was banished for a while, and, and I think he might have been, I believe, yes, he was tried by the Inquisition. But he went back after a few years. And eventually, Del Canto married the daughter of this marriage, the daughter of his lover. They were kind of different. <laughs> so Montemayor was, well, I mean, you would wonder some about, you know, how he worked. But, you know, life then was so violent that, you know, maybe everybody did these things. Uh, and it, it just was kind of survival of the fittest. So Montemayor... Someone tells on Calabajal, someone says, hey, some, there's a Jew, practicing Jew here, and you didn't report them. And so they, they came with a, a, a group of soldiers with Montemayor heading the group, and they, they took him back to Mexico City. 
and that's kind of where it ends. There's some documentation, but basically the stories are that he died of, of sadness. And that is something that's repeated over, over. Murió de tristeza. And I always wondered if he was killed in prison. I don't, you know, but I don't know. Um, his family ultimately was all arrested. And within a few years, everybody but two young nieces had been burned at the stake. This entire family, uh, except these two girls that might have been under 10 at the time. And even then, a few years after that, they were also executed. And it's interesting because if you look at the history of the Inquisition in Mexico, there's very few families that they did, they killed all of them. And some people have told me that, that know a little of the history say, no, well, they had to, the government had to kill, or the Inquisition, had to kill all the Caravajas because he ha they had the right of succession. And this way, no one would be able to be the governor again from that family. But that's only speculation. Another thing happened, which, which is one of those things that I kind of like to look at and, and just wonder how it came about or wonder how the current narratives came about after this incident. Montemayor, over the years, became uh, the good guy. He became the one who, who founded, finally founded the city of Monterrey and it, it was able to take, like, it, the, the settlement stayed because they had tried two times before, uh, Carabajal tried once, Del Canto tried once, and both times the settlement fell apart. But when Montemayor did it, it stayed together. So he was able to find, uh, put together this, this village and even got a, a cedula, you know, like, documents stating the origination of the town and all that. And so he is like the person, when, when people talk about colonial Nuevo León, in people that live in Nuevo León, they, say, they talk about Montemayor. They say, well, he was the one. He was the governor. He was, yeah, well, this happened to Caravajal and he died, but Montemayor was the one that put everything together and and uh, he's the leader. And then at the city hall of Monterrey, there is a statue of Montemayor where he's looking, you know, really powerful and strong. And, and it's sort of a brass colored, uh, very, very visible that many, many people see um, on the side of a, one of the main streets downtown. With Caravajal, you don't hear anything. Mon one of the main streets in Monterrey is named after Montemayor. I know there's one of Caravajal, but I'm not quite sure where it is. There's a statue of Caravajal on the freeway going out to Saltillo to the west. And it's interesting, again, you know, to kind of look at how the narrative circulated. He's on a horse and he's looking down. And so it's a very different presentation from what Montemayor was, was um, projected to be. Well, this is the information I had when I went to Sevilla to the... Archivos Generales de las Indias, which are the archives of the colonies. And I found the documents that said that Montemayor was never designated the governor of Nuevo León. He just took over the position. And after Caravajal died, nobody seemed to care. So Montemayor said, okay, I'm governor. A few years later, the viceroy sent someone to investigate what was going on, and they found that he was calling himself the governor, and so they said, okay, we'll name you interim governor, But he was, and he stayed that till he died, but he was never named officially the governor, which is fascinating considering that, that now, or for the last 100, 200 years, he's been talked about as this wonderful hero that put the city together, that, that was very brave and all, but instead he was, he killed his wife, and he uh, turned in one of his closest friends to the Inquisition. After Caravajal died, there were still some people that he had brought that were in the area. Some had gone further to the south. But the ones there, it is said that they took off from New Mexico, and they caught a few of them, and they killed them. But some actually made it through, and, and then there was further movement up to M New Mexico. And I believe that these, this group is connected to the, the people presently in New Mexico that say that they are descended from Jews because they were extremely isolated. It was the place to go hide 
that, you know, who could ever catch you if you go to New Mexico considering what, what the roads, and, or there were no roads at the time. Um, another thing that I, I think is fascinating, too, is the official story in Nuevo León is that after Carabajal died, there were no more Jews. It was over. They killed all the Carabajals. There's none left. It's totally just gone. And this was told to me by um, employees or like community teachers at um, at the, the Museum of History in Nuevo León. It was told by the main historian of the city. It's like something very, very common. I I was thinking I want at the time looking that I was kind of thinking about looking at narratives and looking at present day identity. I end up I ended up um, enrolling myself in a community history class on colonial Nuevo León. Wow, <laughs> that was amazing because I learned more in that class than I did from anything else I'd read. About a hundred people had signed up, and they had like different historians come in week after week. And so they had the his, the director of the uh, Estado Museum, which was up on a hill, which was very kind of the serious. A uh, historical museum that was kind of high class. They had uh, some young historians that had um, that specialized in writing about the indigenous people, and uh, another one that had written some about what he called the ideology of the Jews, and about an area that was a little north of of Monterrey called Linares, which the the people in Linares at one point around 1750 mass migrated to South Texas. And they were, when you hear about people that lived in Texas before it was the United States, it's those people from Linares, who were probably Jews, came and settled, you know, all, you know, Brownsville, what is now Brownsville, McAllen, probably as, well, as north as the, as the Nueces River, and then a little bit to the west of, you know, to Laredo. So these people came in and they were telling us different stories and, and, um, the director of the Obispado Museum, one night when she came to speak with us, told us very clearly, she said, there were no Jews. After Carabajal died, it was over. And then after that, the Franciscans came. It became a very castle, a very Christian uh, colony or Christian city. And we never had to deal with that again. And so then, after she says that, remember, this was a large audience, like four or five people raised their hands and so she would call they said well no but my grandmother said that we're Jews and then someone else raised their hands my grandmother said and I have a story that my grandfather did such and such and so all these different people would actually get up and say it and they were all ages they were your age they were in their 20s 30s 40s there were people in their 60s and you know all different kind of like I'd say from if you want to label it kind of lower middle class to extremely wealthy male and female uh, very educated to not very, very educated. And so that night, when the people said that, she said, no, 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 no. Well, you know, your, your families were just talking. This is folklore. Well, she, another, another historian came, the one that studies Linares, that studied the people that had immigrated over here. And again, he was asked by the audience, and they said, the audience said again, well, my grandfather said that his family, they were Jews. And over and over, and there were like six or seven people. And then he stood up and he said, this story is ideology. It is not history. And it was very firm. And maybe because he was a man, I'm not sure. Everyone said, okay. <laughs> uh, but among themselves, you could hear everyone was talking. The last, court, last class of the section on colonial Novo Leon, because they had like colonial Porfiriat, you know, different eras. The last section was the same woman that was the director of the Orispado Museum. And so, again, somehow in the, in the lecture, she mentions that, that there were no Jews and all. And, and so I asked her, when she started with questions and answers, I said, I find it very fascinating that according to documented history, there were no Jews in the colonial Nuevo León after the Carabajal. 
I find it fascinating that so many people right, you know, keep saying, but it's not true. And I was just wondering what, what you thought about that. And she started screaming at me and said, there were no Jews. And everybody's like, oh, my God. And so then a big argument started in the room among the 100 people. And they're going, well, you know, uh, no, 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 no. My grandmother, my grandfather had a yarmulke. And so-and-so lit candles on Friday. And another one said, no, you're lying. You're making it up. And, and it just went on for about 15 minutes. And I think people became afraid. Uh, not that anything violent was going to happen, but it was they were people were pretty confrontive with each other. And then finally, this ang- this Anglo couple from the United States uh, that were probably in their early 70s very calmly said to her, "We love your work." And that's exactly how they said it. And then everyone calmed down. And uh, it was really just amazing. And then. Around that time, one night before the course started, I was standing outside and I, I spoke to someone that worked for the museum and she said, no, no, this, there's just none. And, and they, then they would keep telling me that so-and-so said there were none and so-and-so said there were none. So it was like the official versus the unofficial. Sort of like weapons of mass destruction versus what Joe jo Wilson found <laughs> in Iraq, you know. Um, all, and at the time, I was still thinking, well, you know, you know how stories circulate in families, and, and so you, you believe it if your grandmother tells you. And I was like, mm, I'm not so sure. I had this friend who was, I interviewed a number of times, and then we ended up being friends, who was, uh, uh, he collected artifacts. He was in his mid-60s. He was an artist who did watercolors. He um, collected all sorts of different colonial artifacts and paintings from the uh, 19th century. And the very first thing he told me when I met him was the same thing. My family, they're Jews. And I go, how do you know? He goes, because it's always been talked about. And it's the Trevino family, he says. It's the Trevinos that are Jews. And I, you know, he was kind of eccentric. Like, even though it was 1998, he never had used a fax machine. He didn't drive. He was really old world. And so I thought, oh, it's just succulent you know, wanting to make his family sort of more interesting. Um, so then what happened was that around, I was I guess it was around late 19, no, around early 2000, one of the things I used to do during the whole period was when I wasn't in Nuevo León, because I spent about three years going back and forth and one entire year of those three living there, uh, I used to check the Monterrey newspaper every single day because I would find the craziest things in there. And of every place, I mean, it's just like you would think this was this was Tel Aviv. Their Jewish, their Jewish rabbi had a yearly, a monthly, no, sorry, weekly column in the Monterrey newspaper. And everyone else says, no other city has that, just Monterrey. But uh, he was elderly and he had, you know, like, how does the Jewish family live and all that. And anyway, so I used to check the paper all the time because I would find just different, I was always just looking for like little clues, you know. Um, So then, one day I saw the photograph of a very attractive woman that someone had invited to speak in Monterrey about the Jews. And they had a web page, so I, I looked it up and I contacted her. And so the next time we were both in Monterrey, we met. We ended up being very, very close colleagues. In fact, just this last December, we put together a panel for the Association for Jewish Studies to talk about this. She's my age, but a student going back as she's older, and so she's getting her Ph.D. at Hebrew University and in Tel Aviv. And so what she's looking at, it is, it's folklore, but she's looking at tangible evidence, not like me where I'm saying, okay, so-and-so told me this. No, she wants to find something real. You know, She wants to find a hat. She wants to find a dress. She wants to find a story that was written. And so she's been working on her dissertation for oh, a very long time. It's almost finished now. And she's made easily from, from Israel probably 15 to 20 trips over the last seven or eight years. And so what she's done is she goes and she interviews people. And people talk about her so they know, you know, who she is. And so the word started spreading out. And so she took her video camera stopped using it after a while though but at first she took it and then she would meet with elderly people and say okay tell me all of your 
customs. You know, how did you bury people? Did you wrap them up in a, in a white sheet? How did you sweep your house? It, has anybody ever heard this one about sweeping the house to ev- so everything will go to the corner of the room, the dirt? It's an old Jewish custom from centuries ago, and it's very, very common in Mexico. In fact, my family did it. Uh, I know lots of people that, that sweep that way. They don't sweep out the door. They, they sweep everything to the middle, and then they pick it up. Um, of course, the, the lights, uh, there's a town outside of Monterrey called Wallawises, and they have, it's very interesting how they've combined things. They created um, a day for the Virgin of Guadalupe, it was on the 12th, but they create a festival for her. They call it the Festival of Lights, and the whole town gets lit up with candles. I have never been there, but Shulamith went, that's my friend, Shulamith Halevi, and it's just amazing the way she would explain it to me. It's just all these candles, all these people. And, but they're saying, you know, it's for the Virgin of Guadalupe. It's not, it's not for anything else. Um, so Shulamith kept interviewing different people and seemed to try to focus on the Trevinos. And she had a reason, even though at first she didn't have, like, something she could really put her hands on. But I found, again, in Sarah Belden's memoir that was written you know, 30 years ago, Sarah Belden lived in Monterrey. She was a young woman, like in the 40s. She said that in the early 20th century, there was a store in downtown Monterrey. Of the of these three brothers owned it, and it was called Tres Hermanos Garza, Tres Judíos, something like that. Tres Judíos, and it was on the sign outside, and nobody ever thought anything of it, but that. That's what they call them. And the Garzas were supposed to be, actually they were, they were tied with the Tijerinas and the family sort of, the names sort of split like in 1650 or something. But they were some of the first um, uh, settlers there. Another, another story that I heard uh, from Achilles, my, my artist friend, he said that, and he never could give me an official date. He just said, it was this guy, you know, a long time ago, somebody named Joseph Trevino came from Spain with a lot of money and 10,000 head of cattle to Nuevo León. And I believe it might have been around 1690 or so, probably the end of the 17th century. And that he came and that Aquiles believed that it was sort of like Carabajal, that, that a group of Jews in Spain had gotten some money together and sort of financed him to come. Joseph Trevino is, is, does ex- did exist. He's all over the documents. Um, and yes, he was extremely wealthy. He was also the head of the Santa Hermandad in Monterrey, which was sort of like the police. So he was the guy that sort of um, uh, ran things in a sense. Um, Nuevo León was also, you know, I was talking about northern Mexico being very isolated. Nuevo León also had another quality that I didn't know about until, until I was, you know, started writing on this, was that Diego de Montemayor died, and then the viceroy named Martín Zavala, was it, no, I'm sorry, Agustín Zavala from the town of Zacatecas as the governor of Nuevo Leon. It's about 1612 or so. So, uh, Agustin Zavala is named governor of Nuevo Leon. He lives in Zacatecas, but he never went, he never set foot in Nuevo Leon, ever. And he stayed governor until 1625 when then his son was named governor, and his name was Martin de Zavala y Sepúlveda. And he was the first governor since, or official governor since Carabajal that actually set foot in and lived, well, actually even just went into the territory of Nuevo León. So that means that from 1596 to 1625, there was no viceregal presence in Nuevo León, except, well, no, Joseph Torino wasn't there yet, so not even him. So you can imagine what they were thinking they could do or what anyone could do. So when I went to Sevilla, I would just look through records just to see, again, if I could just find anything. And one of the things I, it came up at least three or four times 
in the contemporaneous archives, like from that time period, they would say, those people in Nuevo León do really weird things. Those, the people in Nuevo León, we found out they were doing things that were very strange. We found that the people in near, Mont near Cadereyta, which at the time was the capital of Nuevo León, uh, were doing things, that, conducting rites that were blasphemous. And I, I saw it over and over, and I thought that was really that was really interesting that that this was a, a narrative that was circulating back then because I still have heard it in the last few years um, verbally from different people said, well, you know, who knows what those people in Nuevo León have done up in the mountains? And there is a narrative, and this is just again narrative. So I I don't say that it actually happened or not, and I have never found actual. Um, proof but it is something that's been repeated to me over and over again was that they said there was a lot of maybe possibly incest up in the in the mountains um, when the area was so isolated but that it's also possible that that story might have come about because the Jews married among themselves so nieces married uncles and so that's another possibility um, that and it, that wasn't something that someone made up. That is a real thing. I mean, you can, if you look in the genealogies of the people, you can see it. In 1999, a young woman that lived in Monterrey that had actually come to live with me for a while, a year before, she uh, was about 23 years old. She was from a middle class family. She had a, a college degree in biochemistry. Um, she ended up marrying uh, another biochemist, now has a bunch of kids. She told me, she said, oh, I really liked Agustin. Agustin was a young man that was coming to visit her grandmother's one day when I was there. She said, I really liked Agustin. He's so handsome. And, and he was, the, the young man Agustin was. He had a Ph.D. in, in agronomy, I believe, from Texas A&M, but he was from Mexico, and... Last I heard, he's working for the Gallo Wine Company in Napa Valley. But she used to say that, that she had the biggest crush on Agustin. But the most interesting thing was Agustin was her first, was her cousin. Not her first cousin, her second cousin. But they were very, very close. I believe his mother had lived with the family for a number of years. So I think here, if you meet your second cousin, you generally kind of don't marry them. So she knew Augustine because he was part of the family and she grew up around they played together. He was uh, let's see, his mother was his her mother's first cousin. So maybe I should do it like this. So it was, uh, this is Rosalva which is Anna's mother and this is Mercedes who is Augustine's mother. Okay, so Mercedes has Agustin and Rosalva has Ana. And they, let's see, Rosalva's mother was a sister to Mercedes' father. <laughs> anyway, okay, that's kind of how it worked. Well, but again, like every time they had any kind of family gathering party, it didn't have to be a wedding. It didn't have to be a big deal. Augustine came because they were considered part of the family. The family was encouraging her to date him. They said that he could have been a really neat guy to marry. They said it in front of me. I mean, it was just totally accepted. And let me do this. This is, let's see if I can. Um, I'm going to put down some more of the <laughs> genealogy here. Okay, I'm going to go back to Rosalva. Let's see. Rosalva's father is Ventura. And he married Soledad. And then they had a, you know, several kids. Ventura and Soledad are second cousins. So Ventura has a sister named Margarita, 
and she married Soledad's cousin, <laughs> Hector, and they had a bunch of kids. And then Hector's brother married, I don't know this woman's name, but his name was Ephraim. They married, and their first cousins. These were first cousins. So, Ventura, Soledad, Margarito, yeah, all these three couples married around 1950, 1945. So it was um, quite interesting. So by the time Anna came along, again, it was still considered acceptable, even though it's not mentioned very much. Yes. Um, I have friends of mine that are from Saltillo, and uh, my friend was telling me that there were not very big but small communities of not only Jewish people but also Lebanese people. Mm -hmm. um, could it have been that that, as you showed in the map, is so is, is such an isolated part of northern Mexico? Could it have been in the earlier colonial or even late colonial period a hub for people, you know, in in Europe and perhaps the Middle East trying to, you know, search for or hide out in, in such place? Um, there was a, a there was a Lebanese population in that area and in South Texas or, or on the border. There were merchants. Uh, they were in every city. Um, I believe they came around probably the na late 19th century. I may be wrong, but I think that's about when they, when they arrived. Um, you know, the most interesting thing to me about this is not so much even the stories. It's, again, sort of where the stories are and who tells them and who reacts to them. I'm, I'm really fascinated with just people's reaction to when I tell them something. Um, Aquiles used to buy things. The priests from local churches in the little towns needed money, or maybe the guy that worked in the sacristy needed money, they would go to Aquiles, knock on the door and say, okay, I have this statue of the Virgin, how much can you give me for it? It would be from the church. And Aquiles would give him cash and it was all over. So you can imagine after a few years, Aquiles' house was stuffed with everything from churches mostly. Um, and so, ah, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> No, I can't. I can't remember what it was. This is okay. Well, let me just go on. Um, okay, this is another thing. Let me let me do this. Cannibals, cabrito. This is another connection. I'll probably come back to the other one later. You know, when they kept talking about the Indios Barbados, they kept saying they were cannibals. And there's a story by the, one of the first historians uh, in Nuevo León, who wrote this about 1670, about a group of soldiers going out into the area and finding a container with some liquid in it. And they decided to taste it. And so um, they liked it. They didn't know what it was, but they all drank it and they liked it. And then someone else showed up and realized that they were drinking something called mezquita mal. And what it was, it was, it was sort of the um, human blood, ground bones, you know, some ground organs, all put together with some fruits. And so when the soldiers found out, they, they started um, throwing up quite a bit um, so then later as the Bar Indios Barbados were still supposedly giving trouble to the people in Nuevo Leon, in 1880 the governor of Nuevo Leon passed out a decree to distribute poison to all the ranchers in the area so they could poison all the indigenous people that were there because they wanted them to really go. And this is something I, I found out kind of towards the end and it was actually in a, in a journal published by one of the universities there. So it actually had been 
documented, but again, people said, oh, no, 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 there's, there's none. Um, and again, yes. Could you repeat uh, the date and just exactly what it was? Uh, was it an official decree sending out The boys? decree? It was approximately 1880, and it was Governor Vidaudi. I think it's two R's. And yeah, so there was poison in the streams. Yeah. Um, and that's, even when it's mentioned in the article, which was published in the 1970s, there's not, uh, you know how sometimes you'll read something and you'll say, you'll see, say you're reading about wounded knee or some terrible massacre so the person you know the author will say well you know this happened in such and such date this many people were killed or or this many people did it and then usually there'll be something like um uh these kinds of things didn't happen anymore or later or uh the leader of the community punished the people that did it there's always like some kind of reference to it being inhuman this humane. This wasn't. There was nothing. They just said they did it, and then he just went on. Um, one of the things he said in that article, he he said that the los coloniales estaban en una zozobra perpetua. And zozobra, I'm not really sure, but I think it's like angst, hysteria, fear, and for perpetua, perpetua. It's perpetual, that there was this all, always this, this fear. Um, and when I was at the course on colonial history, many, many, many people brought it up that there were stories in their families about people being kidnapped by the, somebody from an indigenous tribe. It was very, very common. And, of course, the people that were telling us were that they could talk about that. And they would say, yes, it happened over and over. And then other people would say, well, yes, my grandfather's sister disappeared and all this. And so one of the things I did in the book, which was a little bit kind of different, was I decided in cert only in certain sections that if I knew something, like maybe in my family or some other place that I'd already heard the same story, I would put it in there. So in my book, I decided to tell some stories of people being kidnapped in my family. And so there was, let's see, one woman, they don't know her name, uh, and she disappeared from around Laredo, Texas, Possibly around 1860, they never saw her again. Um, another man in, was a Confederate soldier in, around Laredo, 1865. He had two sons and a wife. And approximately in 1869, he was killed by the last Comanche raid that occurred in Laredo on the American site. Um, and then the one that was, well, the death, the one with the death was pretty bad. But then there was another one. His name was Sebastian. And when he was eight years old, he was captured by an indigenous tribe around what is now the boundary between Nuevo León and Coahuila. So it's like, I never do this right. So probably here, uh, around a town named Candela. Candela used to be in Nuevo León. Now it's in Coahuila. Sebastián was captured by them and remained with them for three years, and his job was to take care of the horses. After three years, he was able to escape, and he actually found his family again, and he, that was my great-grandfather. Uh, so that, I, it was like I could say, okay, this really happened. You know, I, I saw all these people talk about it, but this really happened. But the funny thing is, I had been listening to these all my life, and I thought people were just exaggerating because it just seems like out of a whole different time period. But I think it's partially because northern Mexico was populated in that way. Now, if you want to critique this, you can say, ooh, you know, everybody talks so bad about the indigenous people. They don't want to be connected. They don't want to be descended. They, uh, they said they never existed, and, and that's true. It's a very racist society, and... Uh, not everybody, not everybody, but one of the main things I found in Nuevo León was 
people's skin color was more important than almost anything. And that if people were lighter skinned, they had much more movement. Although, I mean, I've seen some recent studies on, on immigrants to the United States that they say they're lighter skinned, they make more money. But uh, over there, it's definitely based a lot on, on the lighter skin. And then they would divide themselves and say, okay, well, if there's any dark ones, those people married in with the indigenous people, but we are pure Jews. We are, oh, the other story was we are French because there is, well, this is all over Mexico, but in northern Mexico, it's in several cities. They say that a number of French soldiers escaped after Maximilian was killed and went into the small towns. And so that's why supposedly a lot of towns in Nuevo Leon have people, so many people that, that don't look Hispanic, that don't look like they have any indigenous features. But there is, it's funny, it, it's something, it's, it's a difficult thing to study and it's a difficult thing to analyze because as I got to know everybody, almost always I kept hearing the same stories that somebody would say, well, there were no indigenous people in our background. There just none. It just didn't happen. I just, our family wouldn't do that. And these are nice people that they're not, you know, mistreating anybody directly. But I was really shocked by the attitudes. And, and I talked to some colleagues and they would say, well, you know, they're very, very middle class. Maybe, you know, what you're finding is more in the middle class of, of Monterrey, of Nuevo León, and then, you know, and the, of the upper classes too. But maybe the working classes, especially the working classes that have come in from the south in the last century to work, um, they, they're more indigenous. So there's like this big separation that supposedly, you know, people from the middle class are not supposed to marry from the working class. And then there's the other level at the very top that they don't marry. They just marry each other over and over. Um, those at the very top are written about constantly that they are descended from this, these Jewish families way back. And um, it's also said that that they kill each other at different generations and that um, that they made their money it's, they started they made most of their money that their fortune began during the American Civil War because they were passing embargoed cotton to the south and so they made a lot of money with that and then that started that gave them the seed for their industry. Um, that is another thing I found in, in a lot of the texts and talking to people that, that the boundaries, it was interesting. You'd cross the, the real ground and it would be a, it would be a different in different country. I mean, a lot of people still spoke Spanish. There were some connecting customs, but you, it was really strikingly different. It still is strikingly different. And, but what was permeable was contraband. And it was, it was assumed, like 1890, 1880, it was assumed that everybody with a little bit of money was involved in contraband. It, it was not considered wrong. And I've seen this over and over and over again in history textbooks. These are not just stories people told me. Um, so what happened was these families descended from, from Caravajal's people, made money uh, dealing with cotton. With the money, they started a, a factory, a glass factory, I believe. And then they decided to make beer. So they, had, they made a glass factory. They had a tin factory. They made a, a, a brewery. And they ended up having everything they needed to produce beer. And that's initially how they made a lot of their money. And after they did that, they started sending their next generations to universities in the United States. Um, and they became more and more powerful. And ultimately, when I was writing Delidia, which was around 2000, several of them were in the top 10 wealthiest men of the world, people from Nuevo León. Um, and those people are the ones that own this, there's one company that's come to the States. It's called Cemex, C-E-M-E-X. You probably see it because that was from Monterrey. They bought out Sunbeam Bread also. 
um, there's a number of different areas that they've kind of joined, you know, our economy with. But they are, yeah, we're talking people on the level of Bill Gates, major money. Also very tied in with Opus Dei and very traditional Catholic practices, sort of, which is a whole, a whole other thing, too. One of the things I found was that there has been, over the history, a, a disengagement with the Catholic Church. The church is there. People get married by the church. They baptize their kids. But there's hardly anyone goes to Mass. Parishes are just kind of for show, in a sense. People belong. They give money. They will attend at Christmas or the Day of the Virgin on December 12th. Uh, but there's this lack of, of connection with the church. Part of it has to do with Mexico banning the church, you know, many times over history. And so there's this kind of like a negative attitude towards the church that way. But a lot of times in the present, people told me that they didn't like the church or the nuns or the priests because they stole money. They took money from everybody. They were rich people that just wanted to be in a convent. I was really amazed at the, the intensity of the anger that people had towards the clergy there versus what, say, Latino families had towards the clergy here where there were lots more connection and closeness. But the position of priests is different. Over there, there's, they don't have a lot of contact with their parishioners. Um, one of the things I saw over there, too, and this is over history and probably came from their isolation, is there's lots of folkloric Christianity. People just make their own. And, and like places you, everywhere you go, and, and maybe it's just everywhere in Mexico, uh, people make their own shrines, their own little miniature churches. Um, they they have like their own rites. They have their own special saints that they kind of decide they're going to work with. Aquiles had a sister, and actually I met her before I met him. Her name was Josefa Sepúlveda, and she died about a year ago at the age of about 85. Josefa grew up in a village near Monterrey. Her father was a wealthy landowner. And the family lost a lot of their land during the Lázaro Cárdenas time when, when a lot of the land was uh, appropriated and given out to the, to the, to the working class people. And so Pepita that's what they called her, and her family moved to the city, and he lost, I don't know, 700 hectares. It was a lot of land. And then he soon, the father soon died of a heart attack, which they said was because he had a broken heart. And so Pepita decided to become a nun with the St. Vincent de Paul. And so she went to the convent, but then her mother pulled her out because they needed her to work. She was very, very, very beautiful, when she was young. I mean, she would rival anybody in Hollywood. And uh, one of the Maderos, who was one of the descendants of Francisco Madero, the president, was her pretendiente. Her, he was in love with her, wanted to marry her, but she didn't marry him. Pepita ultimately married. I really, they, she really didn't talk about it very much, but she had a son. Um, and on her own, she found some property about 30 miles outside of Monterrey in the 1960s and built a sanctuary over 25 acres. It was on a hill. And she made it the sanctuary to what she called La Medalla, La Virgen de la Medalla Milagrosa, which uh, is the virgin that appeared in 1839. They've made a medal out of her, and she's got the blue cloak in her hands, sort of like this. And Pepita said that the Virgin told her to make the sanctuary. And uh, so what she started doing was she, she bought a giant size milagrosa and put her at the top of the hill and then put benches and made like an outdoor church. And for decades, people went in the thousands. When I was visiting with her, I went, I went about three days a week the summer of 1998 and spent like most of the day with her. And I guess you could say it was sort of ethnographic at that time. I would go on Sundays and, and easily, easily 3,000 people all the time. Buses coming from all over, 
Mexico, from southern Mexico, from especially all over Nuevo León. And then she had a little booth that she uh, would sell um, medals. And the story was if you had one of those medals of this virgin, nothing would ever happen to you. And then everywhere I went when I was in Nuevo León, I always saw people wearing the same medal. The medals at that time were selling for a dollar each. And I believe Pepita's son made them. They were like plastic with some resin on top. And sometimes they put glitter. And uh, I would see somebody at a store in Monterrey, like a, like a Michael's store, like Arts and Crafts, and she'd be wearing I said, oh, you have one of the medals from El Santuario. And she said, yes, let me tell you what happened. My husband was wearing one, and he had a wreck, and the car was totaled, and all he did was break his arm. So then I would go somewhere else, and I'd see another one. Oh, you're wearing one of the medals. Yes, you know, my, hu- my father was was run over by a tractor in his head and all he had was the marks and he's fine. And he didn't have any brain damage. And I was told this by like five or six people just randomly uh, in different places. So who knows, you know, but uh, Pepito admitted that Virgin never appeared there, but the Virgin did talk to her. Um, so Pepita, in terms of ethnography, and I'll, I'll finish up now, she was like, my my link, my greatest link to doing all this work. She and and uh, and one other person named Yolanda, who was the daughter of one of these families that intermarried. They they were both women that were single. One was much one was like in her fifties, and Pepito at that time was in her late seventies. But they were my links, where they would suggest where I should go next to find something out. Because initially I just went to go look for folklore, but I noticed that people were just so obsessed with history. They were always telling me stories about something that happened before. So I thought, wow, this might be more interesting than looking for, you know, spells and magic or whatever. And and so they themselves would find people for me to talk to. And then and then like Yolanda, the other lady, found a television program person that made programs on on local history. And so she took me to him. I met him. He took me to other people. He sent me to Pepita. And then she talked to me. And then she sent me to her siblings, who one of them was the artist, and another one was the director of a girls' school. Uh, and they would, these were just like these little webs going around. And I didn't go and say, what do you see yourself as? as? Do you see yourself as a, a Novolonese, a Regio Montaño? That's what they call the people from Monterrey. Regios mean king. So it's Monterrey, uh, the mountain of the king. You know, how do you see yourself? I never did do that. I would just, I would just ask them questions about stories. And of course they'd get all excited and then they'd tell me more and more and more. And, and then if I found a good story, I'd say, okay, I have to check and see if there's other people to know about the story too. But in listening to the stories, I found out what they thought they were, you know, just in their conversations. And it was much less intrusive than normal ethnography. Um, but I, I feel I found out probably much more than I would have if I would have gone in the normal way. Um, the only problem is, and this is definitely, I'm not sure if everyone goes through this, but uh, having finished two projects already, the biggest problem is when it's over, you don't disconnect with the people. You stay connected for years and years, and they look for you, and you look for them. And if you don't look for them, you feel guilty. Uh, so it's like you build these relationships to be able to do the work, but then you can't really ethically just let them go once you don't need them anymore. And uh, especially my experience in Mexico, people were so engaging, you know, and were always willing to, you know, do something for you. Uh, are there any questions? Yes. Could you repeat the name of your book again, please? It's, I'll write it down. It's Delirio. And it's the fantastic, the demonic, and the real. The, the buried history of Nuevo León. That was my editor. I put the narratives of Nuevo León, but she wanted the buried history. And 
And the reason the delirio came from a poem titled Delirio about a guy that murdered his girlfriend because he was jealous and he's standing over her with all the blood everywhere and he's, he's saying, I love you so much. You look like this wonderful virgin lying there in your pool of blood. And I would go places in Monterrey and people would recite this poem to me out of the blue, which really would, it would leave me, I have to say, rather stunned. <laughs> And then my friend Aquila said, well, you know, the author of the poem is, uh, the poet is buried in such and such cemetery. So I went over there and I found it. And sure enough, there's a relief. His, his uh, gravestone is of a man that just murdered a woman. And she's laying there. And then part of the poem is, is on the gravestone. Um, so I just couldn't help but put it, you know, in the book. And the rest, well, I found fantastic and demonic things. And the real is like you don't know what it really is. And there were lots of times I really didn't know what things really were. <laughs> yes. And is that available in the U of H bookstore? I don't know. Sometimes they have it, sometimes they don't. Okay. Most people just get it from Amazon. It's published by UT Press and it is easy to find on Amazon or other or other book publishing websites. 